God, we elevate your name above every other name. Thank you, Lord, that you're worthy to be praised. Lord God, we just thank you for your presence in this place. It's come before you, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, power of the church. Lord God, the gate of heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Just put your hand on your heart. God, we open up our hearts to receive your word today. We thank you, Lord, that every time we open scripture that you speak, Lord God, that you know every individual here in this place, that you know every story, and that you speak to us personally, intimately. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give God a little bit more praise. Pretty good. Well, we are in for an amazing treat today, none other than the Reverend Bishop Jonathan Martin himself. <clears throat> you even get like a drum intro, that's pretty nice. Uh, no, listen, uh, Jonathan and Angela, it's pretty crazy. They've only been in our church for uh, about three years, but it's been just a an awesome ride, exponential to see them, um, just the teachability, their growth, their their level of lean-in is outstanding. And um, they are, the mark of influence is on you guys without a shadow of a doubt. More anointing is coming than what you've already experienced. You've got a sense of the price that's before you that yeah, uh, you know, God's letting you pay it one bit at a time. He's not throwing you too far in the deep end, which is good, but you're responding. And, uh, and faith, faithfulness and fruitfulness are synonymous in the kingdom of God. A lot of people think, well, faithfulness is just good enough for me to show up, right? Hey, I'm here, you know. Ah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that hang around that aren't that fruitful. And so real true, the true mark of faithfulness in the kingdom is fruit. If you abide in Him and He in you, you, you and well done, good and faithful servant, all these things come together to bear much fruit. And so when Paul says to Timothy, the one adjective he's looking for is reliable, reliability. And these guys are faithful but they're not just faithful, they actually do stuff and, and, it, and it generates fruit. And it's the way that, so we get Coach Jonathan today in the Transformation series. What a perfect series for him to be preaching. But why don't you just welcome to the stage for the first time preaching, Coach Jonathan Martin. <laughs> Let's keep that round of applause going. We have the greatest senior pastors and Pastor Sam and Pastor Jess. One thing that was made abundantly clear to me during conference, we did just got back from our global conference, is the heart of our pastors. And Pastor Sam and Jess, they're the spiritual parents of us. They're the spiritual parents of our house. I know what this church, I know what this movement, I know what the city of Toronto means to you. So I'm honored that you're having me here today. One more time for Pastor Sam and Pastor Jess. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Like he was saying, this is my first time up here. So if it's your first time up here, welcome. We're in this together. And if you like what I say today, come back next week because I'm just preaching the spirit and the heart of C3. And if you don't like what I have to say, come back next week because I'm not on stage next week. So, uh, like Pastor Sam was saying, my name is Jonathan. My wife, Angela, and I have been coming to this church for about three years and change. We've, I've been in Canada for six years. I'm originally from the States. I'm from colorful Colorado. And we've been married for a little over three years. We have a 10-month-old baby boy, Isaiah. And we have a golden retriever named Gus. Angela sometimes refers to him as her firstborn. 
I haven't had the heart to tell her yet. Uh, I want to kind of piggyback real quick off of some of the announcements that we had. We are here, like I said, we've been here for about three years. Connect Group is one of the first ways that we got plugged into this church. So I encourage you guys, Connect Groups are launching today. Sign up for those. And then I 1,000% am not standing here on the stage preaching today if I didn't go to that men's overnighter two years ago. It completely changed my life. I had an encounter with God, and, like, my life changed. My marriage changed. Angela's life changed. Isaiah wasn't born yet. His life changed as a result. Gus is pretty much the only one whose life looks the same. Um, so if you're a man and you're going, I will see you there. If you're not, I'm telling you, sign up. It's the greatest thing that you didn't know you needed. So sign up and I'll see you there. All right. Transformation. How great has this series been? You guys been enjoying it? I was excited when I knew I was going to be preaching this series because if there's one thing I like doing, it's training. I am overly competitive. I played sports pretty much my entire life, primarily football. And for anyone who knows me, you're thinking, ah, oh, Jonathan's going to come up here and talk about football for the entire time. You might be prophetic. <laughs> but it is. It's a... Uh, I think it's one of the greatest team sports. I think there's a lot that you can learn. But it wasn't just the physical training and things that I've really been enjoying with this series. It's the spiritual training that I've gotten out of today or I've gotten out of this series. It's really what's rocked my world. And we understand, okay, transformation. In order to go through transformation, we need to go through training. And every good training program is going to have a coach. Now, how many of you guys know that we have the best coach in the history of man? We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you guys know that no matter what the training program is, no matter how good the coach is, if we're not coachable, it's going to go to waste. The title of today's message is Put Me in Coach. I was joking because um, I didn't catch that until second service that it's Anybody who knows me knows I would never have been like, oh, yeah, put a soccer picture up there. <laughs> wrong football. Wrong football. Um, the, the, the main verse that we're going to go through today is Matthew, or sorry, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. So you guys open up your Bibles. It says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. All right, so I'm going to give you a quick story. Like I said, I played football. I played from first grade all the way through college. When I started in first grade, I was a kid. I didn't know what I was doing, all right? So I was much smaller, believe it or not. So picture a smaller version of me. I don't have a neck now. I really didn't have a neck when I was a kid. So my football helmet was sitting on top of my shoulder pads, and you just kind of run around aimlessly, right? But my dad was trying to coach me. He's like, because I started off as a running back. He's like, Jonathan, when you carry this football, pretend that it's a loaf of bread. And pretend that on the other side of the field is your family, and they're hungry. You got to go feed them. I played running back for two years. I wasn't very good at it. And if you ask my dad about that story, he's like, yeah, man, your family probably would have starved to death. <laughs> so what did I do? I switched. I switched to the other side of the ball, the good side of the ball. I switched to defense. That's where you want to be anyway because you get to hit. That's what football's about, right? And I started to become coachable. I didn't really know what I was doing still, but I was becoming coachable. My coach said, you know what? You play hard, you play fast, and you play until you hear the whistle. So... On defense, you're supposed to tackle somebody. I just wanted to be a part of the action, but I wasn't that good yet still. So I wasn't the first person to get to the ball carrier. I wasn't the second or the third person. Matter of fact, the referee was about to blow the play dead, and I'm coming over, and then I just fall on top of the pile, contributing absolutely nothing. But I was coachable. I did what my coach taught me. Do not stop until you hear the whistle. So now we're going to fast forward even further. I'm in college now. I'm a freshman in college. It's like the first couple practices of fall camp, and we just did a huge install. Now, an install is basically where you're getting all the plays, you get your playbook, you get all the terminology, all the things that you're supposed to know. So I lined up here. I was supposed to line up here. Play D-line. Doesn't look like a big difference, but this is a huge difference. 
Ball gets snapped, I go screaming down the field, and it's not like when I was in second or third grade, I was the first one to the ball carry. I tackled him. So I pop up, I'm in college now. I'm like, oh man, yeah, this is dope. I'm smelling myself, I'm feeling myself, I'm walking back to the huddle, like, yeah, coach is gonna give me an attaboy. I'm a freshman. I just made a tackle on a senior. First thing he says is, Martin, what are you doing? Why are you lining up in the wrong spot? You're out here freestyling. And I'm like, but I made the tackle. Now see, it would be crazy if the expectations, if the coaching expectations from when I was a first grader were the same when I was a college. You're talking about the things that you're coaching uh, a six, seven, eight year old, that's not the same thing you're coaching a 19, 18, 19, 20 year old. See, the coaches already knew I was big, strong, could tackle. That's why they recruited me. They didn't care about the tackle. They wanted to see, is this kid coachable? Can he listen? Can he submit? Can he understand that there's people on this team that know better than he does? Can he operate in a system that is specifically designed? Running fast, that's effort. Knowing where the ball carrier is gonna be and meeting him there, that's effort. Wrapping up and tackling, that's effort. The coach is like, look man, we are not coaching effort anymore. We need to grow. That's a prerequisite. Effort is a prerequisite. We need to know, can you fit in the system that I've created? Can you play in this defense? In the case of Hebrews, the author, what they're coaching is righteousness. They want to know, you know, they kept making the same mistakes over and over and over again. The Bible says they should have been teachers, but they kept repeating the same thing. They, they, they weren't getting it. God intended us to live a certain way. He wanted us to be righteous. In other words, I've designed a life a specific way. Can you walk that out? That's what he wants. He's like, hey, you know, spiritual milk, cool. This is the meat and potatoes. This is the food that I have for you. I need you to mature. See, Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. Point number one, coaching is caring. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Now, we've heard Pastor Sam come up here and he talks, you know, he jokes like, oh, yeah, when I lift with Jonathan, he doesn't let me skip leg days. Well, that's not a joke. I don't let him skip leg days. As a matter of fact, I try to make sure that leg day is the hardest day of the week. Why? Because I love him. And I know it might hurt. I know the pain sucks. We know that. But I understand what he wants. I understand that he wants to get stronger. I understand that he wants to grow. And he understands these elementary truths. So because he understands these elementary truths, we can now progress our training program. We can graduate to bigger and better things. So now, it's not if we're going to squat on leg day, it's when we squat on leg day, you're gonna do it right. You're gonna get low enough, you're gonna push your legs out, you're gonna drive through the floor. And sometimes if that doesn't work, I just I kind of whisper in his ear and I'm like, if you don't lift this, I'm going to another church. <laughs> we need a strong leader, okay? You wouldn't follow this man if he was, uh, okay, that's, that's. But coaching is caring, say coaching is caring. And it's true, we all have people who care about us. I said, I'm not here if I don't go to that men's overnighter. And Pastor Jerry, shout out to Pastor Jerry at Midtown. We love PG. He didn't so much invite me to the men's overnighter as he did pester me and not leave me alone. He, 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 there was nothing that I could say to this man to get him to stop bugging me about going. And the thing is, like, at the point, Angela and I, we'd been married for not even a year yet, but things were good. Life was good. As far as I knew, I didn't have any issues. But Pastor Jerry knew that my life could be better. He saw something in me that I needed. He didn't get anything out of me going, but he saw something in me. And when you're a good coach, when you have a good coach in your life, like we all do, they're going to keep pestering you. They're going to keep trying to pull something out of you that you don't even realize you have in yourself. At the, at the time, I had been saved for 25 years. I knew Jesus already, but I met Jesus at that, at that overnighter. Pastor Jerry, he did not stop. Hey, man, you're going to go? Ah, I don't know. It's far away. 
Angel needs the car. Oh, man, you live close to me. I'll drive you. Uh, the hotel, I'm not really trying to stay in a hotel. You know, things are tight right now. Oh, but I'm not staying in a hotel. I got a tent. Mm, I thought I had them. I don't have a tent, man. Oh, we got like a 12-person tent. Come sleep in mine. I was like, bro, like, come on, let it go. Matter of fact, I was with Jeff. I was sleeping right next to Jeff before I even knew him. And uh, <laughs> that's a message for another time. But like, anything that I said, he, he kept trying to pull me. And like I said, I had an experience with Jesus. And as a result, my life, the course went completely different. I was going somewhere, I leaned in, I accepted coaching, and I ended up someplace different. See, Pastor Jerry was a coach that never stopped yelling. He never stopped yelling. Like, he knew that there was a difference between me having Jesus in my life and Jesus being the center of my life. And he gave, I'm extremely grateful for him. Like, he gave that to me because he never gave up. And God is that coach. God is never going to give up on us. We'll, he'll nudge. He'll push. We may or may not listen, but he's not, he's going to keep going. He's going to keep going. It would have been easy for PG to be like, man, whatever. This Jonathan dude, he's not getting it. I've invited him. He clearly doesn't want to go. Let me, let me just drop it. I don't want interactions to be uncomfortable when I see him. I don't want to push too hard. No, he didn't do that. That's the God that we serve. And that God, I'm sure he's got to be frustrated because he tells us these things and he shows us these things and he walks with us and he just desperately wants us to get it. But we don't. And the thing is, it's for our benefit. He keeps saying the same thing over and over. He's like, hey, this is going to help you. I just want you to get it. But it's not clicking. I have a quick video clip that is uh, hopefully going to illustrate this point a little bit. Let's go scatter to west, right, tight, F left, 372 Y stick Z spot. Here we go. Scatter to west, right, tight, F left, 382 Y stick. <laughs> Just go scatter to west, right, tight, F left, yeah. 372 Y stick Z spot. Here we go. Scatter. Say it again. I'm... Scatter yeah. to west, right, tight, F left, 372 Y stick Z spot. Here we go. Scatter to west, right, tight. Scatter to west, right, tight, F left. 382, 372, 372. Y stick, Z spot. Z spot. I don't want to break. There you go. Huh? I'm the problem. Might make you nervous, aren't I? No, I just couldn't spit it out. I love how he says, I'm the problem. That's kind of like us. We're the problem. Like, does anybody understand what that play is? Does anybody know? It's complicated. That's a, that's a complicated play. If only Jesus, if only God gave us a playbook. But he did. He gave us a playbook that tells us what to do, how to act, how to be, and it's not complicated. It's not scattered to west, right, tight, F left, 372, Y stick, Z spot. It's way easier than that. It's don't worship anybody but me. It's don't have sex outside of marriage. Forgive. Love people. And the thing is, I keep calling this a playbook, but it's not like, it's not like in football. We don't take these and then we check the call. We, we don't make an audible call when we get to the line of scrimmage. You know, it's not like, all right, don't have sex before marriage. Ready? Break. Uh, unless you love her for a really long time and you've been together for a while and you're probably going to get married anyway, right? Okay, let's change it. That's, like, that's not how these plays are designed to work. It's not, hey, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to tithe. Check, check, check. I got a vacation coming up. And I'm trying to buy a house. No, no, that's not, that's not how it works. So here's the thing. Like, if we know these things, then by the very definition of coachability, which is receptive to feedback, fast, not slow, fast to learn, capable of being taught and trained to do something better. If we don't do these things, are we coachable? I would say no. Proverbs 12.1 says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. This is the NIV, by the way, which is never incorrect version. So if it says you're stupid, turn to your neighbor and say you're stupid. We all are, though. I'm stupid. Like, jokes aside, compared to God, I'm stupid. 
He's a perfect God. God created the entire universe. He's responsible for organizing every single atom of the entire galaxy. He knows the weight of the wind. The weight of the wind? He knows how to make trees. He knows how to make you and me. He did all of these things. And then there's me. I routinely have to look up how to spell exercise. I'm not that smart. I know there's not a Z in it, but it's like, okay, ex exercise. Exercise, exercise, like the C always messes me up. And I think when I get cocky and I think I know how to spell it, it's like, okay, gun to my head, spell it or you're gone. I'm looking at Angela with tears in my eyes because I'm like. <laughs> so like, if we know that we have a perfect coach, if we know that we have a perfect God that is calling these plays for us, that is showing us how to live, why is it that we don't take the coaching? Maybe it's because we think we know better than the perfect God that I just mentioned. Maybe we think we know better than the perfect God. Maybe it's we, ju we only do what we're comfortable with. We, only do with. we only do things that are familiar to us. Maybe it's that we're taking relationship advice, life advice, financial advice from the world instead of God. Maybe we're short-sighted. I, I kind of don't think it's any of those. I think it's way more simple than that. I think a lot of the time, we don't take coaching because when we get coached, we don't like what we're hearing. Looking good is fun. Diet, cardio, lifting weights, that's not so much fun. You're going to be sore. It's going to hurt. Having money, who doesn't want to have a little bread in their pocket? Money's fun. Okay, but you should go on a budget. Ah, budget's not fun. That's going to hurt. I can't get this now. I have to put this away now because I want, like, budgets hurt. Playing in games are fun. I can tell you, running suicides and hills, it's not fun. We say these things and we say, like, oh, man, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust this coach. I'm going to trust this perfect person. All right, but you know, trust me, you're not going to have control. Ah, it's not going to be as fun. To the untrained eye, the untrained person this all looks like constriction. It looks like correction. It looks like uh, things are, it looks like a loss. Like, it, like it's a restriction, like it's things that we can't have. But I would argue it looks like that because we are not mature enough yet. Solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Say, coaching is caring. Coaching is caring, and sometimes it might hurt. But what do our lives look like if we lean in and we take the coaching that's given to us? Point number two, God uses those that are coachable. Anyone here seen Friday Night Lights? My kind of people. Clear eyes, full heart? Can't lose. You got it. You guys understand that that's not just a movie. It's not just a TV show. Friday Night Lights is a very real thing. Like, let me tell you, as a kid from the States, you are hard-pressed to find many places that care about high school ball more than the state of Texas. Whole town shut down, people, like, it's, it's a real thing. The, when I first got here, I was with Angela, we drive past the U of T, I'm like, oh, what high school is that? And she's like, oh, that's, that's not a high school, that's a college. I was like, oh, like high school schools, they're massive. And I have a buddy who coaches ball at a high school in Texas, and you might have 100 or more kids trying to get on a field, but you only have 11 spots on the team. You can only, only 11 people can be on the field at one time. And these kids are like, coach, come on, man, I want to play. Coach, how do I get in? Coach, why am I not getting enough clock? I want to play more. Like, I want to be part of a winning team. And parents, parents are knocking down his door too. Hey, my kid's good. Why isn't my kid playing? My kid should be in the game. My kid should get this, this, that, and the other. Why isn't my kid playing? And my buddy, he's got to say the same thing to everyone. He says, look, we have a film session on Saturdays. It's just for parents and players. If you want to know why your kid's not playing, come to this film session. I'm going to show you what I'm coaching him to do, and then you can watch on film what he's doing. Maybe you can correct him because he won't listen to me. Come on, coach. I just want to play. Put me in. Put me in, coach. What do I got to do? And he's saying, I can't use you. I want to use you. You've been around for a long time. I keep showing you the things that you need to do, but you're not learning. You're not coachable. 
I'm a coach. My job is to win football games, and you are not doing the things that you need to be doing to win. It's not really that different with us and God. God's a patient coach. God's a loving coach. God's a coach that has a 16-0 record. He's undefeated. <laughs> but we, we, we are quick to knock on his door as well. God, bless me. God, fulfill me. God, why isn't my life going the way that I wanted to go? God, why is life so hard? Why is none of these things working out for me? And he's saying, yo, man, that's on you. I've given you everything that I can give you. But when will you be quick to learn? When will you be coachable? When will you be capable of being taught and trained to do something better? Capable of being taught and trained to live better? When will, you be stopped to, when will you stop being slow to learn and realize, I have victory for you. I got it. Like, it, it, it's done. I've shown you how to run the race. And not just run the race, run the race to get a prize. And not an earthly prize, not a temporary prize, an eternal prize. I have eternal victory for you, but you know what? Milk is not enough for you anymore. I need you to eat. I need you to, get, I need you to get this inside of you. I need you to be mature. I need you to live for righteousness. See, one of the biggest elements of being coachable is actually wanting to be coached. When Angela and I were engaged, I know, I always say engaged. Before we were engaged, we were engaging in things that were not honoring to each other or God. Things that God intended for after when you're married. And one day, the Holy Spirit just convicted us, and we had to have a hard conversation. But we knew that it was the right thing to do. And the, the funny thing is, that was the very same Sunday that we decided we were going to try out a new church. It's called C3 Toronto. I don't know if you've heard of it. They, they had this pastor there that had, like, this Australian accent, and he brought a word. That same day, hours after Anza and I said, you know what, keep our hands to ourselves, Pastor Sam had a message about sexual purity. It's like hearing from an assistant coach after you heard from the head coach. <laughs> and it's like, Phew. all right, God, I hear you. We leaned in. We took the coaching. And now this is our church. Now we're here. And I don't tell you this so that you can be in me and Angela's life like that. I don't want you all up in my business. I promise you that's not why it is. But I saw what happened. I saw the fruit that came from our relationship. I saw when we couldn't rely on things as a crutch, we had to learn and we had to grow in our relationship. And our marriage was stronger. I found that there was issues that, that, were, that were not dealt with that we could then deal with. I'm saying these things because I wanted an abundant life. And I want an abundant life for you. I'm saying these things because if you cannot relate to this because you think, oh, this was written thousands of years ago. What does anybody know? I was not written thousands of years ago. I was written 35, yes, 35 years ago. I'm a human like you. You can relate to me. And I'm saying sometimes these things are going to be hard, but will you lean in and take the coaching? God is saying like, oh, you want to get married? Cool. Is your marriage going to honor me or is it going to honor yourselves? We had to do this. And it's moments like that that are defining. It's never too late. The, the enemy is always going to try to tell you lies like, oh, man, you already bought the ring. You're going to get married anyway. It's not a big deal. You've already done it. The damage is done. These are lies. It's never too late to start saying, God, I'm going to do things your way. We took the coaching. So, like, practically speaking, what does coaching look like? How do, we, how do we take coaching? The one thing I love about when you lean into the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's not going to whisper in your ear, hey, do better, and then disappear. He's going to continue to walk with you. We had people that were walking with us. We, we, we started diving more and more into the church. We went to a connect group. We went to a pre-marriage connect group, John and Candace. They ran a pre-marriage connect group. We went. We constantly surrounded ourselves because the Holy Spirit is not going to walk away from you. So anybody here who's like, man, what does coaching look like? I don't understand. What does it mean to lean in? It looks like a number of things. It looks like reading your Bible, having a healthy prayer life. It looks like understanding that when we're up here on this stage, this is not a TED Talk where you take some notes in your phone and then you tuck it away to never read it again. Like this is discipleship. This is, this is instruction for your life. It looks like joining a connect group, being receptive to what the Holy Spirit is doing. Being receptive to people and what's happening in their homes. 
looks like going to next steps. Maybe it means joining team and coming under somebody. Pastor Sam talked about it. Coming under somebody and not thinking, oh, man, this person thinks they're better than me because they're giving me some constructive criticism. No, this person does not think they're better than you. I don't think I'm better than anybody, but I see things that are harming your life. I see things that are keeping you from winning, and I want you to win. It's out of love. Being coachable looks like understanding point number three, which is God coaches to win. One of the most straightforward passages in our Bible is Matthew 6.33. But it's funny, because like that clip I showed, we're quick to misquote it back. We don't get the play just right. I always hear people say, seek first the kingdom, and all these other things will be given to you. Now, I might not be able to spell exercise, but let me know if I'm reading this right. But seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Did, did I get that right or no? But seek first his kingdom or his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Is that right? No. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. These are the actual words of Jesus. If we're not listening to him, who is our trainer? Is it a podcast? Is it some business guru? Who are we listening to? Flawed relationships, flawed humans? That would be like, that's like your dad being the head coach. And you're trying to ask the kid who's on JV right in Pine, right in the bench, like, hey man, how do you get, like, what does he know? It doesn't make sense. Hebrews 5, it talks about how there was a failure to develop. This is week eight of a transformation series. And I'm just hoping and I'm praying that there's not a failure to develop. That we're just so anxious to get out of this. What's the next series going to be about, I wonder? I don't know. We haven't finished this one yet. Like, don't let it pass. Like, this series is not, it's, it's transformation. It's not transition. Like, we're not just getting on to the next thing. What can we do to grow and become mature? When I was in college, this was the difference, right? But I thought I was winning because I made a tackle. I was short-sighted. I couldn't see. The coach had a bigger plan in place. He had a bigger vision. He didn't care that I made a tackle in fall camp. He was thinking about the team. He was thinking about a full season. Can this kid listen? Can this kid grasp something that I've given him? Is he going to be open to correction? Can this kid operate and move in a system that is designed a very specific way? Because this is, this is exactly how I've designed it. God wants us to win. God coaches to win. And he tells us how to win. And sometimes we could, it's, it, it's easy because, you know, humans, we're like, all right, I don't know what to do. God's like, man, don't worry about it. I got you. This is Jesus. He is a human. He will walk a perfect life. Just do what he did. Oh, man, but I'm a human. I'm going to make mistakes. God's like, don't worry about the mistakes. I got you. He's going to die and rise again so you can win. There's already victory. Hebrews 12 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He wasn't looking forward to the cross. He knew he was going to be beaten and bruised. He knew his body was going to be broken. His blood was going to be spilt. It's not the cross he was looking forward to. It was everything after. It was the good that was going to come from it. It was the joy that was set before him. He did it anyway. He knew what was going to happen. He did the hard thing. He did the inconvenient thing. He did the thing that maybe the world wouldn't have said, wouldn't have said to do. But he did it anyway for the joy set before him. He did it because he paid a price so that you and I could win, that we would have a way to win always. This transformation series, I'm just like, don't let it pass you by. I don't want you to minimize what living God's way can mean for your life. He's doing something. He wants us to win. Clear eyes, full heart. It's perfect every time. Will we fix our eyes on Jesus? 
Can we have clear eyes to fix our eyes on Jesus so that he can fill our hearts? We know right from wrong. We know about prayer. We know about our Bibles. But that's, I mean, he's not, this is like college again. He's not, he's not coaching effort anymore. He's not coaching the bare minimum. And I'm not, like, I'm with you. All of this is said out of love. I'm, the, I'm in the same spot. He's like, hey, I have something that is so much greater. But I'm not, I can't, I'm not coaching effort anymore. I need you to grow. I need you to, I need you to experience more. I need you to start taking some of this food in. Because I got this thing for you. I got this victory for you. And it's going to blow your mind. But I can't give it to somebody who's immature. Will you grow? So what does this look like in our lives? Like, righteous living, what does that look like? How do, how do, we, how do we make that happen? What are the things that are, that are popping up in, our, in each and every one of our lives? It's going to be different for everyone. Maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's your attitude on finances. Maybe it's the things that we're consuming, the things we're watching, the things that we're listening to. Maybe it's addictions. Could even be the thing that we're, is always in the back of our head, the thing that's like, mm, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that bad. Here, here, it's not that bad, makes a big difference. And right now, I just pray that the Holy Spirit reveals to each and every one of us what it is in our lives. We are on the way to being spiritually mature people. Let's just listen to the Holy Spirit. When, when he reveals, when that thing pops into your head, Jesus, I give it to you. Like, what, what is this thing? I just pray that, it, that it's, like a, it's like a shining light, that there's no question about what it is in our lives. Because God is waiting for us to mature. It's game time. It's the fourth quarter. We're star players. God, God wants nothing but victory for us. And he's already promised us victory if we play by his, his playbook. No more freestyling. No more trying to do things. It's like, no, no, we're not making up our own rules. God has something for us. He's waiting for us to mature. He's desperately waiting for us to surrender things to Jesus, mature and grow. He's been waiting on us. We are supposed to fit into his perfect design. So will we be coachable? Pastor Sam. Come on. Come on, how awesome is that? Unreal. The original plan um, for today was that Jonathan was going to preach 15 minutes and then I was going to get up off the back of that and do the real preach. Um, and then he just kept talking to me about what he was, we were, you know, chatting through the week. I'm like, man, you got it. Add more. Put that in. You got it. And then, so good. You should have heard me the first time I preached. It was horrible. It wasn't like that. Trust me. No, uh, what Jonathan's... Uh, speaking on so righteousness it's a it's an actually a point of worship it's not necessarily a point of behavior because out of so it's really who is who is God and so in the in this series we really have been trying to ask everybody in the room to consider what is God saying to you and what adjustment do you need to make What's, what's the thing that he's trying to train into your life? And now, so then it begs the question, well, how do you hear God's voice? Because like, how do you know what you're hearing is actually what he wants? It's very perplexing for many people is to, is to know how to hear God's voice. And so I, the, the, the way to hear God's voice is like, it's a three-legged stool, three things. It's scripture, so, you know, nothing God says to you in your heart will contradict what He's already said in scripture. It will align. The second thing is hearing Him directly, hearing His voice, so it's discerning through prayer. This is what we call, it's the rhema voice of God. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit inside you. 
Um, but then the third area, which is what Jonathan's talking about today, is it also needs to align with the church. Or I would even argue like it's a person. So the Bible says, and Paul says, that we have many guardians, many advisors, but we don't have many fathers. And this is the problem with the Western church. If you go to the church in Asia, this isn't a problem as much. We were just there in Singapore, and I'll tell you, it's not. Talking about submission and coming under authority, coming under someone. And so what we do is because we live in a society that promotes individualism. Our society says, be you, live individualistic. Like, do you, go you, get yours. And in this gospel of individualism, what it does is it creeps into the church and we're okay to have a dialogue with someone, but we can treat it as suggestive dialogue. So we can treat it as, uh, you know, I'll take it or leave it based on like whether I think you're right or whether I'm, you know, and so we, so what we do is we surround ourselves with a whole bunch of opinions, but it's an orphaned spirit. It's an orphaned spirit, not a planted spirit, not one, no, it's not covenant, it's convenient. And the orphan spirit is something that you don't want to have. And some people don't know what it means to have a father because your upbringing was perverted or abusive or confusing. I don't know. Some people don't know how to relate to God, don't know how to come under and come under correction. So the question you ask is not, do you have people around you that give you advice? That's not the question we're asking. Do you have someone that can correct you when you disagree with them, you'll do it anyway? Do you have someone, not multiple people, a voice that you trust before God? And this is, you know, this is so wrong with cancel culture is, you know, I'm not saying that there's many times pastors make mistakes, for sure. There's times where, but you know, if a pastor sins and makes a mistake, we don't have a right to cancel them out. What we should do is we should love them and bring them close. You know, imagine if every time you made a mistake, pastors just canceled you. <laughs> it's just kind of wrong that it works the other way like that. But what we do is we take the one person, you know, most pastors around the planet, most church leaders around the planet are good solid, kind-hearted, loving shepherds that genuinely want the better for people around them. And every now and then in the tabloids, we see one that screws it up. But what we do then is we come to church and we withhold trust. Why? Because ultimately we're worshiping an idol of individualism. We don't want to admit that. We just kind of throw it out with the bath water and, and so this three-legged stool is, is like, if I handed you a piece of paper, every individual in the room, and I said, who is your pastor? Who is your mother? Who is your father? Who is the person in your life that has known you for months, maybe years, and doesn't know you based on what you project to their world, but knows your real world? Who is that? And because they know your real world, they don't know what you say you struggle with. They know the root things that are in your world. They don't, they're not just hearing the presentation of what you have for them. They actually can get around the BS and actually get down to what's really going to change your life. Who is that? And the name, the name that you write, who is your pastor? It can't be Pastor Sam. Because I don't have that relationship with you all. But it has to be a name. There has to be someone. So when you and I come to Scripture and we read Scripture and then we hear God's voice and we're like, I think this is what God's saying. Then we say to that person, well, what do you think? And that person can actually have a voice in there. And if that person says, you know what, you're misinterpreting Scripture wrong here and what you hear God saying to you, I just want to adjust it and maybe suggest this. 
that is where real power comes from. And I would never ask, no one should ask you to, to be that person in their life. Not that anyone should ever ask you to be that person in their life if they're not already under authority themselves. And so when I go to Pastor Lorne and Pastor Phil, they're, they're the two voices in my life that when, when they speak to me, I, I take it just about as if it's God's Word. You might think that's cultish, manipulative, and sacrilegious and heretical. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, orphan. I'm sorry you feel that way. The reason you would say that is because unfortunately you've never experienced the benefits of covenant relationship. And for the last 20 years of my life, I've actually just gone from strength to strength and blessing to blessing because I have listened even when it hurts. I have had not many voices, but the right voices of authority and I have come under their mission, submission. I've come under their mission and I haven't made it about me. And I, I'm just saying, as a the spiritual son that has spiritual fathers, wow. Now I hear God's voice. I read scripture and I come under alignment. And the Bible says at the end of 1 Corinthians 4, where Paul's like, you think I'm never coming to you. And he calling, he's calling them because they're acting wrong and immoral and they're doing all this stuff. And he says, he says it's, it's weightless words and there's no power in the decisions that you make. I know I might only be talking to two people right now. Because, you know, what I'm saying, some people... It just, unfortunately, just can't get it. But I'm, but I'm telling you that this, what Jonathan just preached, to get the spirit of it, to be coachable, and to come under not, I'm not where you, you're coachable to a hundred people and you'll take what seems right and is convenient in your own eyes, but you really come under a coach, you come under God in that way, man, you are gonna, you're gonna be so shocked as to what God does with that kind of person. Watch your life. And I could give you example after example after example after example of amazing people that I've seen just go from healing to strength to, to more power, more anointing, greater things. And uh, in God, which typically looks like the other way, humility, surrender, <laughs> it typically looks like that way. All right. That's enough. I'm going to leave that out there because we're in this transformation series and, the, and it's ultimately to see your life go to the next level. And, uh, and if you're picking up what we're putting down, listen to the Spirit, listen to the truth and what He's leading you to and, and, uh, and let's walk this life together. Amen. Amen. Father God, with every head bowed and every eye closed, Holy Spirit, we thank You for what Jonathan has just preached today one of the most mature messages. And Lord God, we want to mature in Christ. So we humble ourselves and we repent of our pride and we come before you and we surrender to your word. We surrender to your voice. Lead us, Lord God. Lead us to the right step, the next step. Clarify our thinking. Lord God, thank you, Jesus. I thank you for this beautiful congregation, Lord God that wants to please you. They wanna do what's right by you. Thank you that the enemy, Lord, block the work of the enemy, block the voice of the devil out of our lives so that we can know clearly what you would have for us in your name, Jesus. And just with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never invited Jesus in your heart, it's the most important decision you'll ever make to surrender to Him, to give your life to Him. And I wanna give you an opportunity to do that. We do this in every one of our services. Or maybe you've once invited Him in your heart, but for any number of reasons, you know your life isn't right with God and you wanna recommit your life to Jesus. So if that's you, if you're someone that needs to invite Jesus in your heart for the first time and start living your life for Him, or you wanna recommit your life to Jesus, 
what we're gonna do in a moment, as a whole congregation, we're going to pray a prayer together. It's a simple prayer that makes your life right with God. And as a way of faith before God, if you're someone that's like, yeah, that's me, I wanna pray this prayer, what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand up just as everybody has their head bowed and eye closed. If that's you in this place, if you're like, yeah, that's me, I wanna invite Jesus into my heart for the first time or recommit my life, I see it down the front, raise your hand, I see it up the back. Awesome, bless you. Is there anybody else? I see it up top, two of them, amen. Who else is there? Yes, that's me. I wanna give my life to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody else who wants to join these four people? The reason i letting you know how many people raise their hand is I want you to know that you're not alone. Is there anybody else? Just quickly. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Or amen, amen. Why don't you stand to your feet right across the room. Let's give God some praise. Amen. It's good. Stand up. Amen. 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 Just repeat this prayer after me quickly and then we can be on our way about the day. Say, Dear Jesus, I thank You that You died on a cross for me. Forgive me of my sin. Help me follow You as my Saviour and my Lord from this moment on. In Your name, Jesus, I thank You that I am saved. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God some praise. Amen. Amen.